uh, I don't know much about the storyline of this one, but I'm glad there's gay people in it. If if you're happier and more comfortable looking in the rear view mirror, that is where we will leave you, bruh. <laughs> Married to a gay superhero with a child. What does that mean to you as a gay man, a gay actor in this town, getting to do that in a Marvel movie? Beyond the dream come true, it's life saving. Can you imagine how many lives is this is gonna be saving? And the fact that Brian is also black, you know, we're both people of color and queer. So huge. You were saving lives. Thank you so much. That means the world to me. I mean, this is why I'm an artist. Well, so that it's I the think opposite of uplifting, I would it think. It does, but one, one, I don't necessarily focus on that. I only talk about that on the interviews. First of all, has your thinking evolved on this? E evolved and evolving. Mm -hmm. Evolved and evolving. The vast majority of Christians today have been brainwashed by Hollywood. Now, you might be thinking, Surely that's an exaggeration. Well, let's look into this. First, let's recognize that the LGBTQ movement explicitly uses brainwashing and propaganda techniques to change people's minds about homosexuality and other non-normative sexual behavior. In 1988, there was a meeting of 104 leading homosexual activists, and they strategized uh, as to how they could change the way people viewed homosexuals and homosexuality. Listen to what they say. This is them in the book. All of this is, this is them. AIDS, though a loose cannon, is a cannon indeed. As cynical as it may seem, AIDS gives us a chance, however brief, to establish ourselves as a victimized minority, legitimately deserving of America's special protection and care. This, therefore, is the question and the challenge. How can we surmount our insurmountable opportunity? How can we maximize the sympathy and minimize the fear? How, given the horrible hand that AIDS has dealt us, can we best play it? How do we take advantage of the AIDS crisis? Never, never let a crisis go to waste. The method. Campaign we outline and after the ball, though complex, depends centrally upon a program of unabashed propaganda, firmly grounded in long-established principles of psychology and advertising. Um, propaganda. By the way, this is what they say about propaganda. The characteristics, three characteristics distinguish propaganda from other modes of communication and continue or, or contribute to its sinister reputation. Again, these are the authors writing. Their program is a program of propaganda. And now they're telling you why propaganda has such a bad reputation. Um, just a few things. One, it relies on emotional manipulation. Two, it uses lies, like one in 10. And three, it's subjective and one-sided. This is their strategy. In emotional manipulation, lies, and subjective, one-sided information. Tell our side of the story as movingly as possible. In the battle for hearts and minds, effective propaganda nodes enough to put its best foot forward. This is what our own media campaign must do. Next. Let's take a look at the three steps of brainwashing. And in 89, they outlined the media campaign. What did they want to do in their media campaign? Three things, desensitizing, jamming, and conversion. Um, by the way, these are the three steps to brainwashing. Um, these, are, these are the three things that they wanted to do. The, this is the way that they wanted people to change the way they thought. This is the way they wanted to get people like us off of a Genesis-oriented understanding of origins and their consequences to another understanding of origins and their consequences. Think about some of the most popular TV shows and movies. Do you want to date Saturday? Yes, please. Okay. <laughs> he is cute, he's funny, he's... He's a he? Well, yeah. When I was younger, before I was converted, I watched Will and Grace, a show featuring two gay protagonists, Queer Eye for the Straight Guy, featured gay men giving fashion and lifestyle advice to straight men. Modern Family normalizes gay marriage. Beauty and the Beast shows two gay men dancing together. The Eternals included a kiss between two gay men. And the list goes on and on. Homosexuality in TV shows, movies, and other media have become so commonplace that most people no longer think anything of it. This is desensitizing, and Hollywood is a key player in this step of brainwashing. Desensitizing, what does that look like? Um, to desensitize straights to gays and gayness, inundate them in a continuous flood of gay-related advertising presented in the least offensive fashion possible. 
If straights can't shut off the shower, they may at least eventually get used to being wet. Desensitizing. Tell the truth. You see a gay character on a show, you don't even get offended anymore. It's just there. We're just so used to it. How? Movies, TV shows, commercials, outed actors and athletes. These are the ways that you desensitize. Get people used to it. By the way, in the movies, the homosexual character has to be the best dressed, most intelligent, wittiest, and funniest character in the movie. And in the television shows, they have to be that. Now, when you get popular people like actors who come out, that's okay. But when you get an athlete to come out, this is even more important. This is why when you get an NBA basketball player to come out, the President of the United States congratulates him. This is why when Michael Sam comes out before the NFL draft, it is national news everywhere you can think of. Why? Because these are the images that must be put forward for this particular propaganda campaign. And please notice that the White House spoke out in both of those instances and in support of both of those instances. Next, jamming. The athlete angle is really important because of jamming. Desensitizing doesn't matter. We just want you to be exposed. Jamming requires a particular kind of exposure. Accuse religious people. Gays can use talk to muddy the moral waters. That is to undercut the rational, rationalizations that justify religious bigotry and to jam some of its psychic rewards. Portray anti-gay institutions as antiquated and backwards and badly out of step with the times and with the latest findings of psychology. Another thing you do as far as jamming, you understand, understand what jamming is. Jamming works when you take two contradictory images and juxtapose them. And so, Christian people hate the idea of the Nazis and the skinheads and the KKK. So what you do is you portray people who are against same-sex marriage as being akin to Nazis, skinheads, and the KKK. Since nobody wants to be accused of being a Nazi, a skinhead, or the KKK, eventually nobody's going to want to be accused of being anti-same-sex marriage. This is jamming. This is why in your average Sunday sermon from a pastor that deals with homosexuality, the first third of it will be apologizing. Imagine this on a Sunday morning from a church. Now church, we're gonna address the issue of adultery, but I don't want you to be alarmed. I am not here to bash adulterers. I love adulterers. Jesus loves adulterers. I have friends who are adulterers. And I believe that our church needs to be open and accepting toward adulterers. And I want you to be, right? That just feels wrong, doesn't it? But every time a pastor goes to preach on homosexuality, we expect that to be up front. Why? Because we've been jammed. That's why. We've been jammed. It has been successful. That's why the most onerous sin that you can imagine from a scriptural perspective has us apologizing for saying what God says about it. Most pastors today stay away from teaching on the topic of homosexuality altogether. And so, I mean, our message, if, I mean, you know, if you listen to my message, they're about lifting people up. And so it's not, I mean, I really talk about the homosexuality when we get on the interviews. And the ones that do usually include so many qualifications and apologies that the message becomes essentially meaningless. I think it's going to be diverse from church to church. Every church has a different opinion on the issue, and every gay person is different. And I think that to to speak the church, the black church or white church or any kind of church you want to call it, are all the same is totally, totally not true. This is why pastors stand up today, and when they preach on a topic that's controversial, their message usually dies the death of a thousand qualifications. I mean, think about it. A guy can, you will not hear a guy stand up, for the most part, and preach on the issue of homosexuality without 15 minutes of justification. Now, I love homosexuals. I have friends who are homosexuals. I am not here to say, da, 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 you know, just say what the book says. Many Christians today are afraid of being called bigots or of being canceled by the pro-LGBTQ movement that they avoid stating scripture's clear teachings concerning homosexuality. Finally, conversion. Conversion, the last step in this process. Both desensitization and jamming, though extremely useful, are mere preludes to our highest, though necessarily, long-range goal, which is conversion. It isn't enough that anti-gay bigots should become confused about us, or even indifferent to us. We are safest in the long run when they can actively 
when we can actively make them like us. They have a whole section in their book on the love the sinner, hate the sin mentality. They despise that. They despise that makes them want to strangle us. That's not good enough because you're calling it sin. That's not good enough. Listen to this. Please don't confuse conversion with political subversion. By conversion, we actually mean something far more profoundly threatening to the American way of life, without which no truly sweeping social change can occur. We mean, the, we mean conversion of the average American's emotions, minds, and will through a planned psychological attack in the form of propaganda fed to the nation via the media and the schools. Many so-called pastors and denominations have fully embraced the LGBTQ agenda, and so have many Christian music artists. Who loves us more than the one that made us? Mm -hmm. I mean, we are, none of us are a surprise to God. <laughs> Nothing but <laughs> who we are, what we've done, you know, and I just feel like that's why, to me, it's so important to set a welcome table. Because I was invited to a table where somebody said, you're loved right now. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. You're loved. And like it, music can do that. Music is the easiest conversation you can have with somebody. Gay, straight, it does not matter. It doesn't matter how we behave. It doesn't matter how we're wired. We're all our best selves when we believe to our core, I'm loved. More and more, it is becoming unacceptable to even just stay silent on the issue. You must either embrace and celebrate the LGBTQ movement or be canceled altogether. And more and more, we see Christians, churches, and Christian organizations compromise on what the Bible clearly teaches about this issue. Clearly, the brainwashing and propaganda techniques used by Hollywood and the LGBTQ movement are working. My prayer is that you will see the truth and not be fooled. The most loving thing we can do for people who are deceived is to warn them and tell them the truth. It's actually unloving and hateful to silently let them continue on the path to hell. So don't let anybody tell you that it's not loving if you stand flat-footed and speak the truth about this issue of homosexuality. What's not loving is to look someone in the eye when God says they are in jeopardy of an eternity in hell and merely wink and nod at their sin because you're afraid of being called names. Hi, my name is Mike. I'm a deacon, a husband, a father, a software engineer, and an amateur maker of videos. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you want to help me in my mission to spread biblical truth, just subscribe and watch these videos until the end, which will help the YouTube algorithm recommend these videos to more people. I'm committed to using the skills and gifts God has given me to glorify Him and communicate biblical truth, and I would be so grateful if you would come be a part of what I'm building. You can visit my website at joyfulexile.com to learn more about me and what I'm working on. I hope you're having a blessed day. I will see you in the next video, and remember, this world is not our home.